our way from, from busy weeks, from even what could already have been a busy day. We enter in here, Lord, to this wall. We're grateful that um, we're grateful you've been with us. But Father, our request is that you'd make your spirit, that you'd make your spirit known among us, that we would experience your love. Because of the fact that you've said that when we are gathered together, when we are united here as one, that there is a special way that we are aware of your presence with us. And that's what we're asking for, Lord, is for that miracle, not simply for us to sing louder, not simply for us to do more, but beyond any of our effort, we pray for your work so that we would know more powerfully that you love us and that you sent Jesus for us and that you're with us now. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing.
could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living Lord. You could imagine so great a mercy, but hearts could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from. Grip on me, you have broken. 
He stood. Well, Father, because he stood in our place, we can stand right now before you at your throne. We can come before you as your children, and you as our Father. Oh, Father, you powerful, you are supreme, you are majestic, you are all those things, you are perfect, you are our, our loving Father. This morning as I was with my daughter and we were talking about the cold days that are coming and even on a cold day the sun is sun shines, it seems to make it a whole lot better. And I was just thinking, Father, you made that. You made the sun. You made everything. You made everything, and it was good. So, Lord, Father, because of all you've done, Lord, even though we've, we've done all that, we, we've despised you, we've sinned against you. So, Lord, we ask you that oh, you make us right with you today, this morning. Lord, for you, you keep every one of your promises. You love us with a steadfast love. And Lord, Father, as Jesus hung upon that cross, Lord Father, was finished, he said these words, I thirst. And the centurion dipped a sponge in some sour wine and gave it to him, fulfilling prophecy. So Lord, my, my burden for our church is that we would thirst after you. Not other things, not people, not possessions, not prestige, but you, that we would thirst after you, Lord Father. And Lord Father, as, um, as we are getting into those days where we won't see the sun every day, it's still there. It's still there up in the sky. So even though we might not feel you, feel your presence, you're still there. So I pray that our thirst for you would not go 
look towards other things. But Lord, we continue our thirst for you when we don't feel you, when we don't sense you. Lord, that we would seek you out through your word, through worshiping you, through reading your word. So Lord Father, help us, help us to thirst after you. In Jesus' name we pray.
name to worship you. Your heart, I want desire. Oh Lord, if there's one thing we are called to do, it's to love you, to adore you, and we will bring our Oh, 
seated. Amen. Thank you, worship team. And uh, good morning, church. How was, uh, how was parking? Okay, did anyone have to go super far? A little bit? So, well, good morning, and, and especially good morning to anyone that might be a uh, guest with us this morning. Um, it's great to see quite a few new faces, and uh, hopefully you were anticipating church this morning and not uh, a diner, but uh, is breakfast served all day over there? Yeah, so you still have a chance, but, but yes, welcome any guests. If you are a guest with us, hopefully you got a little gift from us. There's a mug with some information about us as a church. There's a card in there, too, if you want any feedback from us as a church. Um, you can fill that card out if you'd like. There's an offering box in the back wall of our building. And also, we're about to transition our time of worship into our time of giving. Um, if you are a guest, let the basket pass you by. But if you want to fill out that card, you can also put it in that basket. So if you could give me a hand and grab that basket if you're on the outside of the building and pass it this way. Or if you're on the inside, grab it and pass that out, please. <clears throat> a couple matters of housekeeping here. You'll notice a couple little changes this morning. We're going to be moving, I think, the sound booth over to here. And so if you have any energy or some light construction capabilities, drywall, mudding, painting, would you please see uh, Darren if you're able to help with him uh, with that this week? Um, also, we have uh, Ageless Grace coming up next weekend, is that right? So please see Beth to RSVP. They're going down to Hofbrauhaus House downtown, but they will need a headcount for that. Um, also, this coming weekend is our, our parenting seminar here at the church. So Saturday morning, 8.30 a.m. Um, please sign up for that. The deadline is Thursday, but it sounds like we're in pretty dire need for some child care for that event still. So I think there are two separate shifts. There's a morning shift from, I think, 7.30 to 12, and then a 12 to 4.30 shift. But please email in or see Diane Hall if you're able to help for that um, and still be contemplating signing up or inviting a friend to join us for that. And then we have a guest speaker next Sunday as well to couple along with that. Um, so 8 a.m. or 8.30 a.m. here at the church for the live stream of that. Um, also... Uh, Mark your calendars, a lot of Christmas stuff. Seems like just three weeks ago it was hot. I think three weeks ago I was swimming in Lake Erie, and now Bill's telling us we're never going to see the sun again. <laughs> so I don't, I don't really care for the sun much anyways, personally. But, but uh, ladies' Christmas tea, Saturday the 9th. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this, but mark your calendars for that. Um, Sunday the 23rd here at the church is going to be our, our kids' Christmas. There it's going to be in along with the service, so mark that as well. And then we'll have a Christmas Eve uh, Vespers service as well. So mark all those things on your calendar and just uh, be looking in the email for updates to come and, and more announcements about those things. So, all right, I'd like to invite up our reader this morning, Sharon. Good morning. Today's reading is from Nehemiah 8, 1 through 3, and verses 6 through 7. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the er ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Masiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peleah, the Levites, 
Help the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. We had to throw a few names in there for Sharon. Let me read to you a quote before we pray. So the first thing that I read in my first week of, um, of preparation in, in, our, in seminary, I w- opened up as we were uh, starting our, our reading for uh, the doctrine of Scripture, and I read this in a, a book by Wayne Grudem. He said, throughout the history of the church, the greatest preachers have been those who have recognized that they have no authority in themselves and have seen their task as being to explain the words of Scripture and apply them clearly to the lives of their hearers. Their preaching has drawn its power from God's powerful words. Essentially, they stood in the pulpit, pointed to the biblical text, and said in effect to the congregation, this is what this verse means. Do you see that meaning here as well? Then you must believe it and obey it with all your heart. For God himself, your creator and your Lord, is saying this to you today. Only the written words of Scripture can give this kind of authority to preaching. Today is a sermon on a sermon. It's preaching about a guy who was preaching, and I thought that the best way to start was with a guy giving us a quote about preaching. So, at least you're prepared. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word because without it, we have no anchor, we have no Uh, We have no compass. We have no bearing except for our feelings or our thoughts. And we have enough experience with those to realize that they're not able guides. Father, we don't want to follow our hearts. We want to lead them. We want more accurately you to lead them by your spirit. And so I pray that you would help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one, one uh, commentary that I read titled this, uh, this sermon, Reading the Law for a Very Long Time. And if you look at and understand the, the nature of Nehemiah uh, chapter 8, you, you see, uh, and, 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 and Sharon read this, right? You see all the people gathering together on the first day of the seventh month, which is in, in Israel's history, uh, the seventh month would be the way we look at, like, December. It's, it's, if you say December, everybody kind of knows where you're heading. You're getting toward Christmas. The, the mention of the seventh month had a similar sort of feel in the life and the, the schedule and the flow of Israel's history. Um, but verse 3 says, he read it from, he read from it facing the square, before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. We want to give credit, I think, today to the teens that we have who have been going through our our reading plan. Because I feel like I've got some justification for the way we started. Um, As uh, if, if you're new to this idea... Uh, what our kids are doing, uh, what our teens are doing this year is reading their way through the Bible. And that sounded like a great idea when you started in Genesis because the stories were interesting and fun. And the first half of Exodus really kind of got us through there and then you got into the rest of it. And the second half of Exodus is a little laborious and Leviticus is a little laborious And if you guys have noticed and you've been following along, you realize we got done with the first handout that we gave you, or if you're using uh, your reading plan like this, we are flipping the page. And you're going to get into Deuteronomy soon. So bear with it, because I feel like the teens are kind of doing the same sort of thing. Having made their way through Exodus and Numbers, there were a couple stories in Numbers, but a book that begins with a really long census and ends with a really long census, it proves to be a long book. So I I do want to commend you guys, though. In the spirit of Nehemiah 8, you probably feel like you've been reading the law from about early morning till about midday, and you're kind of wondering, man, 
does this book pick up at all or what's going on? It does. It really does. But we believe that God's word gathering his people together, uniting around it, one, um, it, it is a powerful force. One, one commentator said it this way. An insatiable appetite for the faithful and relevant interpretation of scripture, scripture is a powerful unifying force within the life of God's people. And really, that's what we believe here as a church, isn't it? I mean, it's a big part of why we do what we do in this meeting here now. Uh, but it, it's a big part, not just of what we do when we're gathered here, but in our, in our smaller group settings, we've been trying to be more and more deliberate about having our people gathered together, having all of us gathered together where what we're doing together is asking, God, what are you saying to us because we want to hear, we want to be in submission to your word, and we want to go out and be faithful to obey it. Because that's exactly what happens. We're going to make our way through this, this entire chapter. There's 18 verses here. Um, Sharon introduced it for us in verses 1 through 3 and verses, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of drywall dust, I think. Verses 6 and 7. Um, but, but essentially what we see from this passage is a group of people who um, they're, they're gathered to listen to the word. Uh, they then listen to the word and then they obey the word. So in short, the thing we're doing now is what they were doing thousands of years ago. And the way that, that they respond to the word, I think, should be exemplary for us. So, so many times, and in other cases here, in, uh, in books we've looked through, we've gotten examples that haven't been positive. I, I, this one sure seems to be. In fact, we, we, in this text, have, I think, a great model for what does it mean for us uh, to gather together around the word, listen to the word, and then to obey the word. So, strangely enough, those are our three points. So let's take a look at verses 1 through 3 again as we just see. Uh, these guys are gathered together. Verse 1. All the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning till midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. So in this setting, we have one Bible, right? No, nothing behind, nothing in people's laps, really. One Bible given through just an oral presentation. Nobody gets handouts or notes. Everybody's just listening for a very long time. In fact, it's the example of uh, moments like this, commands in the New Testament to have these words read to the, to the gathered people that called us a, a while ago to question, why do we not actually give more attention to the, to the reading of God's word? It's why we wanted to make this a more central point in our service that we would be gathered together. And, and I'm grateful for the fact that, uh, that those who are reading are actually, uh, there's uh, some planning in the works for them to think together how would we do a better job of, of reading the word to the people that have come to be in submission to the word? Uh, one suggestion even, what if, what if we had everyone stand uh, every time the word's read? I thought, well, it'd be kind of weird if one person did that and not everybody. So let's, let's talk that through. But there's, there's something about our, our posture before the word of God that I think is significant. It says something about us as a people, doesn't it? when we're coming and asking, what, what attention do we give to the word? And, and here, verse, these first three verses, what we just see is these folks have come and they've gathered. It, it, in a strange way, it reminded me of when I used to be a Boy Scout. We would uh, hang out and there would be some snacks, just like, you know, you're trying to do when you're bringing boys together. Um, but we would all line up, the whole troop gathered, and we would get together in our, in our little divisions, and then one person would get up and he would put up a scout signal, and we would, we would respond in a similar way, and we would say, a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, brave, obedient, kind, cheerful, thrifty, I think brave in there twice, 
Maybe because we were super brave. Clean and reverent. Two. On my honor, I will do my duty to obey the scout law and to do some other stuff, which I've forgotten since then. But, uh, but that, that moment of bringing us in seems so corny, and it was. Um, the fact that we were all dressed up in our Boy Scout uniforms probably made it a little bit more so. Um, but there was something about it that was just reminding us, hey, you do a lot of other things in a lot of other settings, but when you come here, let's just remember what we're doing, why we're here, and what our purpose is. Our purpose is to obey this scout law and to make sure that our motto and our oath is the one thing that drives us. And that's one of the main reasons that God's word takes a central place for us as a people too. Because there's a million things that we could do when we get together. And there are, aren't there? There are a lot of reasons that we get together as believers. One, one illustration that I've heard is of a, of a, a, a an old uh, puritanical preacher who was going around and visiting uh, some folks and uh, went to knock on the door of a guy who hadn't been in his church for a while. And uh, the guy answered the door, said, hey, preacher, hey, mind if I come in? No, not at all. Went down and, uh, you know, there were two seats over by the fire, so he just sat down by one of them and uh, the guy knew why he was there and the preacher knew why he was there. He just looked at him and instead of saying anything, he just took a coal and nudged it away from the fire. It was glowing at first, and then he started to look at it for a little bit. They both looked at the coal, and that glowing hot coal got darker and less glowing, and less hot. And after a little while, he took the coal and nudged it back over to the side of the fire again, and Soon that little dark little charcoal started to glow and be bright again and the preacher looked up at him and said, well, thanks preacher, good sermon, I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> it happens for us in a lot of different settings, a lot of different things that we do can have that kind of warming effect, can it? It can remind us as we come in, we don't, we don't necessarily have the, the Boy Scout salute, We don't have necessarily our motto or everything that we repeat together, but actually we do. We have songs that we hope become more and more familiar to us that that are mottos and anthems. There are truths that we believe, not primarily about us, but primarily about God, that should warm us, that should reinvigorate us. And when we're drifting from those, when we're drifting from our our gatherings, we, we find our hearts turning less and less hot and less and less glowing. But one of the main reasons that we gather is that we could demonstrate, like like is said here in in verse 1, this unity in submission to the word, as as Montyard said, an insatiable appetite for the faithful and relevant interpretation of Scripture is a powerful, unifying force. They gathered as one man in the square before the water gate. All of these folks have gathered together. They've, they've come together. Why? No, second point kind of continues it on as we see there in verse 3. All the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. More literally, the way that, way the way that reads in, in the original without it being... Uh, sort of translated there, it says all the, the ears of all the people were to the book. The ears were belonging to the book. They were connected to the book. They were ears of the book of the law, and Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, All the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads, and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Reformers would speak of a moment like this, and a common phrase back in that day was that the word was deeply fixed in our own hearts. Because it's not just everybody's gathering to, to see each other, not everybody's just gathering for the coffee or for the music. 
Everybody's gathering to listen. And as that quote that I read from, from Grudem reminded us, nobody's coming to listen to personalities. Nobody's coming to affix superhero status to individuals. It is an honor, it's a privilege to be able to serve in a church where you're nothing but, uh, you're nothing but a piece of glass. Hopefully less and less noticeable over time so that what you're seeing through is far more important. We're here to listen to God. Our ears aren't to a preacher. Our ears aren't to a, a brand. The ears are attentive to the book of the law. The word then is deeply fixed in our hearts. And as it continues in verse 7, the Levites, whom Sharon read so well, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. Listen to this description of it. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, okay, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Now this, this is so audacious in some ways, isn't it? All of the people, why did they come? They came to build a wall. And Nehemiah is course correcting them. No, no, no. This wasn't mainly about getting a city established or getting a wall up or getting some security. That's helpful, but that's a means to an end. The end is that we would live in glad-hearted submission to God. So let me tell you what God has said to you. I come as an emissary of the king, bringing his edict before you to tell you this. And from morning to noon, the word is proclaimed. And because the word hadn't been proclaimed for a very, very long time, the people are recognizing that, man, without being redrawn to God's word regularly, they have drifted. They've drifted far. There was much they were not to do that they did. There was much they were supposed to do that they had neglected. They are so far off course. And as the word is being read and God's people are listening and their ears are to the book, they are amazed at how far off they are from God's standard, from his desires, from his nature, from his character, from his holiness. And they're recognizing so much like Isaiah when he gets into this picture of the temple. Whoa! This is, this is really bad for me. It's bad for me. It's bad for my people because we are unclean and you are holy. What are we to do? The word is hitting the people the exact same way here in Nehemiah. They're, they're aware. We're off. The people wept as they heard the words of the law. And what do the Levites do? This, this is amazing. They say, in short, don't feel the way you're feeling. Can you imagine telling anybody that today? Our feelings are the ultimate, right? These are the things that are the truest parts of us. Uh, sort of. I, emotions matter. But they, they, they matter the way that a thermometer, I think, matters. They just tell you what's going on. They don't matter the way a thermostat matters and that they dictate what's going on. In fact, speaking of thermostat, it might be getting a little warm in here. We might want to just turn it down a little bit. Okay, then we're good to go. It's too cold. All right, you know, it is, it is hard to figure out what we ought to be in terms of, so we're going to stay with where we are. Bill, good decision to keep it right as it is. To the point of the analogy, though, emotions are an intriguing topic to address, aren't they? Somebody tells you they feel sad, and you tell them, don't feel sad. That's exactly what happens here. Sort of. Because when you understand weeping in the terms of a, a, a Mideastern mindset, like what's going on in this day and age, and in this era, uh, grief isn't just sort of an internal emotion. Grief was a proclaimed emotion. 
Maybe one of the best ways to think of this is the, the funeral processions that, 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 that are, are common in the day, right? This is one of those that Jesus met up with when he went to heal the boy that had died. How did he know that there was, well, there was, there were professional mourners that were a part of all this process. The people aren't just weeping like sort of like uh, tears silently streaming down their cheeks. They're they're wailing. They are mourning. Do not mourn. Do not weep. He's not addressing just something inside. He's saying, here's what you should do with what you feel. I get your guilt. I, I get your guilt. But there's an answer for your guilt. There is good news in light of all that you've heard because the law isn't simply a statement that you've drifted from God it's also the means by which you get back to God which is an odd way of describing the law right oftentimes when we're talking about the gospel we'll say and we'll proclaim we don't get to God we don't earn God's love because of what we do and that's true but the law wasn't simply about what to eat and what not to eat the law was about how to sacrifice, what feasts to observe. And what was the point of a sacrifice and what was the point of a feast? It was the offer of and the reception of God's forgiveness because of your guilt. So what, what Nehemiah and what the Levites are pointing out is, listen, I, I get that you are hearing some bad news right now. Let me remind you of this as well. There is good news. And the seventh month is one of those months where we celebrate this good news. This time now is a time for us to rejoice. There's a lesson for us in this, a, str a strong lesson. Because you can't tell people about God without helping them to understand God in contrast to who they are. God in contrast to us is one of the primary motifs of how we understand our theology. God is this and we are not. And that as both sort of our own nature kind of things, we're finite and he's infinite in so many ways. But it also has moral components. God has a, a holy part to him that is pure and we are impure. Anytime you're going to introduce God to people, they will always feel some level of disconnect from him, and they should. But if we leave our presentation of God there, we'll be doing a disservice. It would be like the Levites letting these guys just mourn and feel horrible about things. There is a presentation of good news that says this. I get your guilt, but God has come. He didn't just proclaim your guilt and say, fix this. He came to absorb your guilt into himself so that you might be right before him. This, this presentation that we have kind of sort of in seed form here is a great reminder of what we want to do when we're telling people about who God is. Listen, you can't on your own feel good about you and God because you on your own are not good with God. But God's great love for you bridged that gap so that all that you've done, all that you'd become could be absorbed by Jesus and you could now stand righteous, loved, forgiven, and adopted by him personally. And that's reason to rejoice. That's amazing reason to celebrate. So that when the Levites are coming up, <laughs> audaciously saying, you should respond and feel and act and behave this way, not that way, it's, it's freeing. It's not burdensome. It's not just coming to somebody who's depressed and saying, well, God says you should have joy, so you have some joy. Though, Later, they will say something very similar to that. But the point that's here is that these folks are coming and saying, you need to understand the full nature of what God is presenting for you here in his law. And it is that, yes, we are guilty, but we can be forgiven. This is amazingly good news. And, and church, what we need here at, at, at Trinity isn't simply these kind of pulpit moments, these kind of Sunday morning moments. We need these deep Levitical kind of moments. Verse 7, the Levites helped the people to understand the law. In other words, the proclamation of the law wasn't enough. That just being given out to the people wasn't enough. Now, they understood the words. In fact, that's who's gathered, right? It's, it's, it's everybody who could understand. So it wasn't a problem with Ezra. It's not as though he had screwed up. And it wasn't a problem with the people. It wasn't as though they couldn't understand or that they were stupid. 
It was that, 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 that we needed a communal chewing on the Word of God. We needed sort of a, a, a working it over, a, a, a digesting this together as, as one body. How, how should this affect us? The Levites are there helping the people to understand the law while the people remain in their places. They read from the book from the law of God. So do you get this? It, it goes out big and then it gets digested in, in smaller settings, in smaller groups. We need this deep Levitical work at Trinity in order to be able to take the next steps. And the next steps are really kind of our third point. Everybody gathers, everybody listens. They do it in big ways and they do it in small ways. And then they obey. Here's a, here's a quote from, uh, from Kevin DeYoung. I love the way he phrases things at times. He said this, Some Christians need encouragement to think before they act. All right? All true. But others need encouragement to act after they think. And I think that's the, the second part of this text really gets to that point. Having thought about, understood, and received and listened, what next? What do we do? Well, Look what these guys do. They obey, and they obey first in really, <laughs> in really enjoyable ways. Remember, their grief has a commendable component to it there in verse 9. But as we transfer into verse 10, they said, or sorry, then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Listen, their grief, like I said, was, was, it was commendable, but in light of the good news, the seed of the gospel, it, it just wasn't appropriate. We can, we can be aware of our sin, certainly. We can be aware of and so many times affected by sin, both ours and others. But, but what we want to be for each other is people who are able to say, in your grief there is still cause for rejoicing. In fact, God has even set up ways for us to rejoice. Why? Because it's joy that comes from the Lord that strengthens us. Not joy that we get from our circumstances. Not joy that we get from our own emo emotional sort of fortitude. It's not the joy that we get because we're doing better than other people are. It's, it's the gospel that always will compel us forward. So the first way they get to celebrate, I, 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 or they, they get to obey, is simply in their celebration. Let's just, let's just ask this question first. Do, do we obey God this way? Is there for us individually and then for us in small groups when we get together? And it, is there, in, when we're all together, is there a joy that marks us? Not, in, not a stupid Pollyanna joy that just ignores the fact that we're living in a sinful world where we've contributed sin and others have sinned against us. I'm not, I'm not talking about being stupid. I'm talking about being strong. Strong in the fact that we turn our eyes from the things that would grieve us rightly and we remember Jesus came. And if God has sent his son into the world, how much more are we able to then enjoy what he has done? Not in way of ignoring, but because of the, the dark background of sin at times, to be able to look and say, ah, oh, God's love for me right now shines out so brightly. I think we want to ask a question, is there a sense that we obey God in these celebratory kind of ways? Verse 13 continues on with another aspect of their obedience. It says, on the second day, the heads of fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. Are you kidding me? We just got a wall built, man. 
We just put up brick and stone walls around us. We did it in record-setting time. It took us less than two months to get this thing up. And you're saying now God is telling us we have to live in tents? This feast is called the Feast of Booths, but that might make you think like trade show. It's not trade show. Nobody's selling their wares to each other. Another name for this is the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Living in Vulnerability. The Feast of Remember You Used to Be a People Who Were Out in the Wilderness who after God freed you, required you for an extended period of your lives to live in total vulnerability to him. No home, no land, no garden, no hunting. The only way you ate was because God put stuff on the ground for you to go out and pick up. And your one task of obedience was don't take too much so that it rots for the next day. Trust God day by day. Live in your little flimsy tents. Trust God for your daily provision. And just so you know, this isn't some biological thing or some sort of natural thing. We will take one day where you can gather twice as much so that you have your eyes on the fact that God's the one who provides so that you actually don't have to go out and gather it on the Sabbath because the day before the Sabbath, you can get twice as much and, and it'll, you know, miraculously over that period of time why? Because God provides. God takes care of you. And what they do after all the law has been read, after all the people have broken down and gotten in, all of the heads get together and they come and they say, okay, what else? We know there's more. What else? What do we do? This has so affected and gripped us that all of us are taking responsibility for our little clan. We're coming together and we're saying, we will obey God. So how? What do we do? What's important? Come on, we got to strategize and figure out how do we then go ahead and actually figure things out. These, these people obey not just by the big celebration. They, they, they obey also from not just enjoyable ways, but in these intellectual ways. They, they come together to study the law. Because they need to remember that their confidence isn't in a, a city of walls. It's in a God of tents. God lives in a tent. He took care of us for such a long period of time while we were in tents. And having lived that way and being able to live in the land again, we failed him. We greatly failed him. And so he sent us away for a long period of time. And now that we're back, and now that the temple is built, and now that the law has been read, and now that the, the city walls are up, we're ready to go live in tents again so we don't forget. So God doesn't prosper us and we trust our prosperity. God doesn't bless us and we trust our blessings, but that we always have our eyes on God. We will obey him. Verse 15, and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. And the, the people obey. And they don't just obey by going to study. They're going to celebrate. They obey in practical, sacrificial ways. Look what they do. Verse 16, so the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. There's tents everywhere. Look up and there's tents on roofs. Go to the temple. There's tents all around. Everybody's camping everywhere. Why? Because it's been proclaimed out there. Guys, we are going to make ourselves seriously uncomfortable so that we remember. We are going to invite a lack of blessing and comfort and joy of being able to live in our houses and living protected and living in, in great conditions. We're going to go live in tents for a while. Tents made out of stuff like leafy trees and wild olives. There's no air mattresses. These guys aren't doing better during this time. This isn't camping for fun's sake. This is uncomfortable. 
And it's uncomfortable because they're choosing to be obedient to what God has said. He said, don't forget. Okay, we won't forget. No, yeah, I don't trust you to not forget. So we're going to set up a week of remembrance so that you don't forget. Verse 17. And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in the booths. For from the days of Yeshua, the son of Nun, to that day the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. You know what these tents were? These tents were a testament to the past to say this is the way that God took care of us. Remember that? But it was more than that. Because it wasn't that they were supposed to leave those tents, go back to their cities and their walls and their structures and say, and now we need God no more. No, of course not. These tents were not just a testament of the past. They were a commitment of faith for the future. They were a way of them remembering and saying, we trusted God and he was faithful. And therefore, for all the scary stuff in our future, we will trust God now. We will trust God still. We will continually trust him for every moment of weakness, for every moment of frailty. We will have faith for the future. And we will obey in practical, sacrificial ways. Guys, I think the American dream lies to us because it says your life should just get better and better and better. And that's not true. We will need to trust God all the time. D.L. Moody said it this way. There will be no peace in any soul until it is willing to obey the voice of God. But we think our peace is going to come from a fat retirement. We think our peace, I tend to think our peace is going to come from a more stable building situation. One where we don't have to fight for the five spots that are left for us out there. I don't entirely know, but I know this. The Lord, ooh, he squished me this week with frailty of our situation. I write to our landlord and I say, uh... I'm counting spots, and I'm not seeing any. And I get a response that says, I'm sure it'll work out. I'm sure she said it nicer than that, but that was the way I heard it. Like, I don't feel like you care too much about our dilemma here. And I, I felt frail. And I thought, wow, that, that would have been so great over there, but yeah, frail. And I say, okay, Lord, practical, sacrificial way. This God is trustworthy, loyal, hopeful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. A Christian is what? Obedient, good, moral, and perfect? No, we want to be holy. But in this passage, a Christian is trustingly and gladly obedient. And that's it. No more promises. No more guarantees. Just this resolve. We're going to trust God. We're going to follow him. And if it's a life of cities, then great. If it's a life of tents, then great. Let's never forget how faithful he's been in the past. Let's look to the future with the same eyes of faith. And I think, let's go to verse 18 and let's have this as our motto. I, I, I love this. In fact, Zoe, let's put this somewhere in the building. Or like maybe a mural across the whole wall. Verse 18. Who'd have thought? Day by day, from the first day to the last day. Let's just have that, let's not have that be the, the terms of this agreement we have with God. How long are you going to trust him? Uh, day by day. You've been trusting him a while, yet from the first day. How much long are you going to keep trusting him? Up uh, till the last day. When's the last day? I, I don't know. I just know it's today and it's the next day. That's my resolve. Inside, no guarantees, no promises, and here they are, day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God, they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly, according to the rule, and we'll pick up the rest of the story, chapter 9, Woohoo! hoo teaser. But until then, we'll have our seven days. What are you going to do? You may have tent-like days where the winds are beating and the nylon's flapping and you know, there's no nylon. It just feels like leafy olive stuff. You're going to trust God. 
or you may go back to your stone walls and everything's good and you get to enjoy the fruit of some of your labors. Okay, you're going to trust God. Some trust chariots. Some trust horses. Not us. We trust the name of the Lord our God. So let's pray. Father, whether your word thrills us, whether it grieves us, whether it excites us or whether it just reminds us that there is a faithful heritage of those that have followed you, that have gone behind us. Lord, we pray, let this be our anthem day by day from the first day to the last day. Lord, we know that you will be faithful day by day, so we trust you day by day. Lord, we know you will be the joy that is our strength from day to day, and so we Pray, Lord, would you help us in our grieving to rejoice in you day by day. And Lord, may this be true, not just on our first days, but however many day by days you give us until it's our last day. Lord, may we, may we faithfully trust you to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.
So I thank you, Darren, for consistently and faithfully opening up God's word to us and saying, this is God's word, this is what God's word means, and this is how it applies to us. And you've, you've done that so faithfully and consistently. And, and I know when we were looking for a church to join, uh, we were talking to some of our friends that went here, and uh, they didn't say the youth group was great, they didn't say the worship was great, they didn't say the uh, small groups were great. They said, you got to come to hear Darren preach. That was what they said. They said, you got to come here, Darren, preach. And it is, yes, amen. And it's been, it, it, it's just a blessing to sit under your leadership and you teaching us the word. And I just, just want to take this time to thank you. And as Pastor Appreciation Month, and I appreciate you. We appreciate you for the way you, you serve us. So, so thank you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. As we gather together to hear the word preached from here, as coal is coming together to be rekindled every week, and we we all listen. But we, we don't listen to you. We don't listen to Brad. We don't listen to myself. But we we come to hear God's words spoken through uh, the men in this pulpit, and that's what we we come to do. And we as we do that, we're going to hear. We're going to be convicted because uh, the Holy Spirit through His Word will convict us and show us how we don't match up with God with with Christ. That's what it's meant to do. But it's not meant to stop there, as Darren showed us. It, it's meant to bring us back again. And Again, to the foot of the cross where there's forgiveness, where there's hope, where there's power to obey God's commands. And when we do that, third point, everyone obeys. And we obey even if it, it's uncomfortable, because it will be uncomfortable. As we obey God's word, it's not going to be comfortable. We can't have a nice Christian spin on the American dream if you're going to be a Christian. It's going to be uncomfortable to obey God, but we trust in his faithfulness. We trust that he's been faithful in the past. He's going to be faithful today. He's going to always be faithful. And we can trust and we can rest in that. So, so as you go, as we go through the next seven days, uh, go as coal, spread out. Uh, to your neighborhood, your school, your work, wherever you go, and, and spread this good news. But then look forward to the day, seven days from now, we come back together and gather again once again. again. And we gather and we listen and we look for ways that we can obey God's word and we, we can become more like his son through his word being preached. So again, thank you, Darren. It's such a blessing to be uh, under your leadership and hearing the word preached and God just working through uh, through you in our church. So, so thanks, man. So as we go, um, again, just one quick reminder, the parenting weekend is coming up. So if you want to go, please let us know. And if you can provide child care, uh, again, that seems like it's an urgent need. So let us know so we can uh, have parents come and to 
and has child care provided so we can come and just uh, just hear God's word through through Paul Tripp. So so go go as coals spread and look forward to seven days from now coming together and seeing you all again and worshiping and hearing God's pre- words preached one more time. So thanks, you're dismissed. <laughs>